Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is salvation by grace. And we've been seeing how God, in His grace and mercy, saves sinful human beings through faith in Christ because Jesus Christ is the sin bearer. He is the atonement of our sins. He is the one who turns God's wrath away from us by the shedding of His blood. We've seen that this theme of sacrifice is prevalent in the Scriptures Old Testament and New Testament, but it's all fulfilled in Jesus. That means there's no more sacrifice that needs to be made. We are fully acceptable to God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask you a question. What does that tell you about God? You see, this salvation by grace reveals something so wonderful about God. It reveals Him in all His holiness, in His purity, His righteousness, His compassion, his love and his grace. So in this program today we're going to see how that God has revealed his glory. The glory of God revealed in this wonderful salvation by grace. Hello and welcome to this Sword of the Spirit teaching on salvation by grace. Now about halfway through this program of teaching on the topic and we're going to be talking today about how God's salvation brings the revelation of who He is. In recent sessions we've been spending a lot of time talking about the cross of Jesus Christ and it's true that there at the cross we see God's heart laid bare and we see who He is as we see him nowhere else in, in all of the scriptures. Now, salvation brings the revelation of who God is. When God acts in salvation, he is acting according to his nature. And so, as in so many of the other places in the Sword of the Spirit series, we show that God's words and his works demonstrate who he really is. Because God is, by definition, it's utterly self-consistent. All his deeds, all his words, his thoughts and his actions and his attitudes must conform both to each other and to the totality of who he is in all his holy character. This means then that God's supreme act of salvation for the world on the cross must also be God's supreme act of self-revelation to the world through the death of of his beloved son. And here at the cross we find above all the revelation of his glory. We've seen in other studies in glory in the church that the word kabod in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for glory, is used to describe from time to time a person's material prosperity, a person's physical splendor, or even somebody's good reputation. But the word is generally reserved for God himself. The Old Testament uses the expression the glory of God in two main different ways. First is a parallel term to the name of God. If God puts his name there, that's where his glory is. If he reveals his name, he reveals his glory. And this is the self-revealed character of God. And the second way it's used in the Old Testament is to describe the visible revelation of God's localized presence. And it's that, in these revival days, that we are seeking above everything else, that God would reveal his glory, that there would be a localized, visible revelation and demonstration of God's presence. Put quite simply, God's kabod shows people where he is and what he's like. It's a localized, visible manifestation of his absolute holiness. When we look closely at the Old Testament, we see that his glory was revealed in the created world. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now, 
we also see that God reveals his glory to his redeemed people. God's purpose in setting the people free in the Exodus was to show the world his glory by delivering his people. And so also too in the deliverance from Babylon, God's glory was demonstrated. Isaiah 40 verse 5, the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken, prophesying of the deliverance from Babylon. But we also see in the Old Testament that the glory of God is revealed particularly at the hour of sacrifice. In Leviticus chapter uh, 9 verses 6 to 24, we have the, the description of the burnt offerings that were going to be made. And then we find as a result of this time, when we are talking here about the sacrifice of the, uh, for the people, and we find then, let me take you right to the end, Leviticus chapter 9 and verse 24. 23, let's read from there. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. These sacrifices were to initiate the priestly ministry, to activate the priestly ministry, which was all about offering sacrifices. So it was very fitting that at that time of the consecration of the priests, the glory would come, which shows that God always manifests his glory at the place of sacrifice. And we see too, when the tabernacle was established and when the temple was built and sacrifices were made, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So the priests couldn't even minister there any longer. So the glory comes at the place of sacrifice. Now, in the New Testament, the word for glory is doxa. And this is normally used in the New Testament to describe the revelation that Jesus brought by grace and the powerful deeds that he did to demonstrate God's presence and nature. The glory of God is seen in Jesus, and that demonstrates that God is present in person and that it reveals the full extent of the authority and regal authority of Jesus Christ and of course his humble self-sacrificing nature bringing together all those Old Testament themes in the person of Jesus Christ in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 it's describing there Jesus the Son of God as being the outshining of God's glory who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This shows that Jesus' person is a splendid reflection of the glory of God. But in the New Testament, the greatest demonstration of the glory of God upon the life of Jesus Christ came at his death. And this greatest manifestation of God's glory in all history, short of the second coming itself, is the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of his cross as the hour of his glory. Father, what shall I say? Glorify your son as your son has glorified you. No, the son experiences God's glory at the cross. And so, throughout the Gospels, we know that the glory of God was seen through Jesus' ministry on the earth. The first Manifestation of this is in Cana of Galilee where he manifested his glory through the miracle that took place there. And then we have the Bethany Cemetery where Lazarus is raised from the dead. If you believe, you will see the glory of God, Jesus said. At the Transfiguration, when his disciples saw his glory. But none of these incidences compare to the glory of God revealed at Calvary. There we see the complete self-revelation of God's nature, the greatest possible demonstration of his grace and love, the supreme manifestation of his absolute holiness and a perfect display of his presence, power, and self-sacrificing nature. Quite simply, the cross is the most visible revelation so far of God's localized presence in the world. 
and of God's holy nature to the world. It was the quintessence of his glory. Now, the idea of God's glory seen in Christ, that's God's localized presence and personal nature revealed through Jesus, is, as I have said, particularly strong in John's gospel. John's gospel shows that God's presence and uh, the nature of God are manifested in Jesus' miracles, which John's gospel calls signs. But it also stresses that God's glory is seen in Jesus' willing weakness, in the voluntary self-sacrifice of his incarnation. We see, for example, in John chapter 1, verse 14, which is a very key passage in all of this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, John 1, verse 14 contains a very important allusion to the Old Testament. I wonder if you know that the word there for dwelt, actually, is the word which means tabernacled. Tabernacled. And the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Notice John, in writing this prologue, chooses a very, uh, well, it's a strong word for human nature and human beings. He says, the word became flesh. And the word flesh has connotations of frailty, frail flesh, weak human flesh. John was saying, you've got to understand this, the eternal God in the person of his son came down and he was made frail flesh. He is really demonstrating that Jesus became a real human being. But he also goes on to say that as Jesus came, he dwelt amongst us. He tabernacled amongst us. And here is a a reference to the Old Testament tabernacle. And uh, so, of course, Jesus did not cease to be God in that he became man, but in tabernacling or tenting amongst us in human flesh, we were able to see his glory. This means that the incarnation is a fulfillment of the Old Testament teaching about the tabernacle, a foreshadowing of the one who was to come to bring God's glory. We know that the children of Israel saw the manifestation of God's glory in the pillar of fire at night and the cloud in the daytime. And this is now building up to the time when Jesus would come as God's temple, as God's tabernacle, and we would see his glory through him. And so, We find then that God is promising in the Old Testament times that there would come one and his presence would be manifested once more and supremely in the midst. Zechariah 2 verse 10. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. And if you remember from the earlier studies, we see that this is the central covenantal promise. I will be your God You will be my people, and I will dwell amongst you. This is God's purpose being fulfilled. And when Jesus came as the tabernacle of God, he was fulfilling this prophetic promise and bringing God's purposes to a climax amongst his people. Now, the glory of God was also associated with the temple and the tabernacle, and it's a natural progression then to think that in John chapter 1, verse 14, we can see that Jesus is the new temple or the new tabernacle who is constantly filled with the glory of God rather than occasionally. In other words, Jesus came carrying God's personal presence and nature. And so, uh, one of the interesting things about this is to remember when Jesus came and he was transfigured and the glory of God was seen, what was the first reaction of some of the disciples? We want to build a tabernacle. His glory, there must be a tabernacle. They understood this. I mean, Peter was pretty confused at the point, but he was, he was groping in the right direction anyway to understand that this glory was there to dwell amongst his people. Now, we know that the glory of God reveals God's presence and his nature. And that means that when God comes, he comes as himself. He never attends a fancy dress party. He always comes as as himself. He doesn't come as somebody else. And when he comes in his presence, he brings everything that is him. 
So, in other words, if we seek the presence of God and receive the presence of God, we get everything that goes along with that. If he comes, he comes as the healer. If he comes, he comes as the savior. If he comes, he comes as the deliverer, and so forth. That's why John makes it very clear. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. So, when God's presence is manifested, he manifests his grace and his truth. We also see that the tabernacle glory was closely associated with sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the glory of God was often revealed at the time of sacrifice. And there are some verses there that show when the sacrifices were made, the glory came. And so it is with the New Testament also. The glory of God is associated with the self-denial, tabernacle incarnation of Jesus Christ. When Jesus came, he had to sacrifice something, didn't he, to come into this world. And that's what qualified him to carry the glory of God. So Jesus' tabernacling amongst us was a self-sacrificial tabernacling in the form of the incarnation. And this then was not the end because he came to this earth as man, in order to die on the cross as the substitute sacrifice. Now, all the Gospels anticipate this revelation of glory through the cross. Of course, they look forward to it in slightly different ways. In Luke, for example, the suffering of the cross is the pathway to future glory. Luke 26, 24, and verse 26. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and so enter into his glory? Now, John, however, shows that the cross is the actual time and place of his glory. John 13, verses 30 to 32. Having received the piece of bread, he then went out immediately, and it was night. So when he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. So what is happening here? The betrayer is gone. The drama of the cross is set in motion. There's, everything is happening now. There's no turning back. And when Jesus sees the betrayer go, he says, now is the time of my glory. He says, this man, effectively, is going to go and betray me, and I'm going to go and die on that cross, but I want you to know this is according to my Father's will. This is my Father's glory. It's important to know that the glorification of the cross or the glorification at the cross is seen in terms of both the Father and the Son together. That's what we've just read. The Son will be glorified and the Father will glorify, be glorified there at the cross. So the presence and nature of God the Father and God the Son are both revealed by the cross. Perfect divinity and perfect humanity are displayed in the drama of Calvary. On that simple wooden gibbet, the holy goodness of God and the best possible example of human goodness were set before the whole world. And we must gaze on them together as they reveal God's holy nature and remind us of what we also should be. Now, at the cross, we see, as I've been building up over the recent sessions, we see more than anything else the manifestation of God's justice and his love. Now, here is an issue that has puzzled some people. How could God forgive sins in the Old Testament time before Jesus came? And in Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, it answers this question. Because it says that at the cross, Jesus showed that God is just for having let those sins go in Old Testament times in the light of the fact that now the punishment had been paid. Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. This is Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Remember what, remember what that word means, propitiation, the turning away of God's wrath whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, 
God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Here the Apostle Paul says the cross vindicates God's righteousness and God's justice because God has forgiven sin and in the Old Testament times it's not exactly quite called forgiveness here, it's God's forbearance. He passed the sins over. In one sense, he said, he just said, well, well, we'll deal with that later. Uh, Don't worry about that right now. If you believe in me, I'm I'm going to let those sins go. Now, from this moment on, he says, your sins are going to be forgiven. So what this means is this. The price that Jesus paid on the cross showed that God was just when he said, I'm going to ignore your sins. Because the truth is, he wasn't ignoring them. He was waiting for the moment when Christ would come and pay for them. And so the Old Testament believers were saved by faith in what Jesus did by looking forward to the cross. And we are saved by faith in what Jesus did by looking back to the cross. And the important thing here is that God's righteousness is vindicated. And here is a great Uh, blow to the devil's spirit of condemnation he wants to put on you. And here's a great blow in favor of your assurance in the presence of God to know that when God forgives you, he does it in his righteousness. He forgives you righteously. It's justice that is being done. So there's no way that anybody can say, it's not fair that you should be free from your sins because Jesus Christ has paid the price and vindicated God's justice. And so if God's justice is satisfied, then we also know that our sins are truly and completely forgiven. Now another thing about this is that in the Old Testament, it was not always so startlingly clear that God's justice was manifested. Many sinners had prospered. Much evil had gone unpunished, and God had often appeared to be impotent, unjust, and at certain times, morally indifferent. But when we come to Calvary, we find that all those questions are answered. In the book of Job, book of Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, we find how people in the Bible puzzled over how can the wicked prosper? How can those who who hate God seem to have no problems? And at times they contrasted that with their own experience to say, well, we're seeking to serve you, Lord, and we seem to be afflicted. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but thank God he delivers us out of them all. They wanted to know why the wicked flourished and the innocent suffered, why sinners apparently went unpunished, and why the righteous were struck by disaster, why it seems at times that God does not always protect his people, doesn't always answer their prayers, or always immediately reward their righteousness. Now, the Old Testament handles this by looking forward to the final judgment by proclaiming that though sinners may prosper for a while, they will one day face the righteous judgment of God. But the New Testament takes this further. Of course, we know that there is coming a day when every wrong will be made right, when every sin will be punished and dealt with, and God will sort out every injustice that the world has ever known. And that is in the future when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom. But the New Testament gives us a startlingly new perspective on this question by pointing us to the cross and telling us that the judgment has taken place at the cross and that God himself who is not indifferent to sin and evil, has borne in himself, in the person of his son, the sin and the, and the hatred and the pain and the hurt of humanity. And when you're talking to people who have a difficulty with how can God be a God of love when there's so much sin and evil in the world, you can point to the cross and say there is coming a time when God is going to reverse all these things. But in the meantime, look at the cross and see God himself coming to bear the sin, the pain, the smell, the hurt, and the heartache of this world. And he did it himself in the person of his son. And so we understand too that the New Testament is saying that the cross is the place of decisive judgment, where judgment has taken place. And uh, what we find here is that in the Old Testament, where God appears to be inactive, it's nothing but a gracious postponement of judgment rather than an unjust cancellation of God's judgment. 
So at the cross, by his sacrifice, God finally and fully revealed his perfect justice by condemning sins in Christ. And on the cross, he gave a visible proof of this innate justice by himself bearing in Christ his just punishment for all the evil of the world. And so we understand that uh, God's justice is seen at the cross, but it's also the cross that points to the future judgment in two ways. Number one, if God on the cross through the person of Jesus Christ is executing justice by satisfying his justice, then his justice is fulfilled. He's also saying, number two, I am a God of justice, and if you refuse to be judged in the light of Calvary, if you refuse my judgment which I have poured out upon Jesus, that you may go free, then you, all you have to look for is the full force of my wrath in the future. And that's eternal separation from God. Hell is a terrible place, my friends. What you must understand is this. There are two places where God pours out his infinite wrath. Two places. He poured out all of his wrath upon Jesus at the cross. And then there's only one other place where God will fully and finally pour out his wrath. And that is in the eternal judgment in the lake of fire. Okay? And there is only one thing that removes God's wrath from us, and that's the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Therefore, if you reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, all you have left is an eternal judgment. It's not as if somehow in hell the sin is finally going to be burnt up or we are going to be finally annihilated as if then justice has been done. No. If you refuse the mercy that comes along with the justice that God showed at Calvary, all you have left is justice without mercy. And that's the seriousness of the Christian message. Salvation by grace. That's what we've been talking about. I certainly have been blessed as I've given this teaching today. And I pray that God will continue to bless you as you grow in the knowledge of his grace. And so until next time, God bless you.